And we turn to hear from uh, Marshall Van Alstein from uh, across the river at BU, uh, who among other things is the person who coined the phrase and uh, assisted society's investigation of network effects, a uh, phrase we now cast off casually, but that uh, has been kind of seismic in its way of having people think about uh, the way that networks affect life and become embedded and gain their own momentum, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, Marshall, I, I think you've got an idea or two to share. Over to you. Well, thanks, um, Jonathan. You're, ge you're generous with credit there. I think there are lots of other folks also working in network effects. I'm hoping that we can do some interesting things with that. I um, also want to see if we can use some platform business models to speak uh, about ways to solve this. I want to particularly thank Jill for her comments on political ads and creating up the context for this, because one of the things I really want to address is specifically the falsity of news and the falsity of advertising in uh, in politics. I think the example just posted a moment ago, deep fakes uh, not allowed in the Twitter case, but are allowed in the Facebook case is exactly the kind of thing we'd like to try to go into. Um, I'm hoping that I can share screen. I can give this a shot. Uh, let's try this. Desktop two. Very well. Um, so I, wonder, I have a couple of slides for a couple of different ideas. Let me know if, if this is coming through or not. So far, so good. Uh, I also want to apologize in advance. I'm literally just coming off of a fever, so my voice is a little bit hoarse uh, relative to what it should be. So I'm hoping that I'll be... Uh, it's a little on the nose, but yes. Uh, you know, it's certainly, certainly relevant. So I want to try to introduce an idea from information economics. A lot of the different solutions for fake news have come from the computer science side or some from the regulatory side. What I'd like to use is some ideas from information economics and mechanism design to see if we might be able to go after it. To give you a quick summary, and I invite uh, feedback on this, I have a, even a short write-up on this, so really would uh, welcome your input on, on ways to approach this particular problem. If we take a look at some of the existing solutions, each of the lines in blue are some of the common versions of it, whether it's fact-checking for crowds and algorithms, uh, whether it's media literacy and educating consumers, uh, truth chasers where folks can kind of, um, you know, follow up false ads with or false information with true information. You know, the other really popular one is tagging and product labeling. You know, the idea being to inform folks that they're um, getting bad information or banning the content or the person to remove the problem or demoting it in the newsfeed. Almost every single one of these has certain challenges. Um, you know, whether it's the fact checking and the product and tagging and labeling, one of the biggest problems there is that they then try to discredit the labeler. Uh, so if the original story is uh, false, and maybe they simply try to discredit the person doing the labeling, uh, as we've seen in some of the attacks in the media. Um, I think there's a wonderful book out on that recently, um, you know, with uh, network propaganda. Um, or if you look at educating the consumers, often there's this question of confirmation bias. So many folks would distrust those who would educate them. Uh, empirically, it turns out the truth chasers just don't seem to work. They seem to have very little impact on what folks believe. And interestingly enough, after Alex Jones got deplatformed from a couple of folks for propagating uh, fake news, it was remarkable that his uh, that visits to his website exploded. So in some sense, he used that not only to increase his popularity, but then claim media censorship and generate even uh, additional revenues from other sources. I should say, by the way, that's fascinating. Uh, it'll be interesting to hear, I think, Joan Donovan, uh, who will follow, uh, may have something to say about it. I had thought the conventional wisdom was that uh, Alex Jones had been defamed as a result of that. So fascinating. Thank you. So it's interesting. I think there may be a temporal version of it. Uh, it's not in this slide deck, but in a different slide deck, um, Alexa, I can show you the actual plot of uh, visits to his websites. And Alexa uh, showed that his rank improved by several dozen places uh, following that for some fairly extended period of time. Um, so it, I think it has eventually fallen back below, uh, but it was immediately after uh, he actually experienced quite uh, an, a rise in attention uh, for having been deplatformed. From all of these different categories, I also then raise a question for you. Which of these methods effectively changes the incentives to produce misinformation? 
You know, one of the problems that's identified here is really what I would argue is really that almost all these solutions put the burden on the user or on the platform rather than the author of the lies. In some sense, almost all of them, the fact checking, the tagging, the educating consumers, the truth chasers, all of these put the burden on someone else and they don't necessarily change the incentives. One of the things we'd like to do is to see if we can actually put some of the burden back on the authors of the lies and see if we can actually clean up the proportion of information that's misinformation uh, in the newsfeed. And again, uh, I want to thank Jill for the setup. In some sense, the problem of fake ads is really wonderful. Was at one extent, we've got Twitter, which makes a decision to stop all political advertising on Twitter globally. Um, so they just won't take any kind of political advertisement uh, for a candidate. And at the opposite extreme is Mark Zuckerberg, who in Georgetown said, you know, they won't fact check uh, political ads of any kind. Uh, they think it's up to the users to do that. Um, so no matter how egregious the lies, they're entirely willing to propagate it on the premise that the users can and should decide. So at the one extreme, Twitter is in a, puts us in a position of no political ads, which prevents political discourse. And it's actually extremely difficult for newcomers to come in and gain a voice. If you're a new candidate and you can't buy a political ad, it's a very difficult for you to actually gain the attention that you might actually want. Um, at the other extreme, um, you know, Mark Zuckerberg's solution is to let basically anything go uh, and they don't want to be the policeman or the arbiter of it and users themselves are then forced to decide. So here's one possible solution. Uh, this is uh, one of several, but one specifically just to try to keep this down to 10 minutes. Suppose that we were to implement something that was with a standard information economic mechanism, which was of the form of an honest ad guarantee. It would be a really simple mechanism. Suppose that political ads came with a guarantee of authenticity from the author. In some sense, this is a guarantee or a bond, which is forfeit if the representations are false, but they are returned if they are true. Now, here are a couple of the properties of this basic, very simple proposal. The first is that no one knows better than the author whether the basis for that claim is true. You've authored that, so the question is, are you willing to stand by the claim of, that you're actually making? It's also the case that if it's simply a monetary pledge, um, you know, an honest ad guarantee, that politicians and democracies are perfectly free to lie if they wish, it just becomes more expensive. On the flip side, um, What's nice about this particular mechanism is that it could actually still work even in totalitarian regimes if it were adopted. In this case, whistleblowers could uh, get their messages out even under totalitarian regimes. It would still be possible to disseminate truth. So in that case, it's an instance where others might try to discourage it, but you could still get it out. The mechanism still works. You're simply trying to pledge that something is true. Um, and in the case of damage, the proceeds can be used to undo the damage or underwrite another public good, uh, if that's true. Now, here's the simple illustrations. Here's a, an example of how this might work. So suppose that an honest ad pledge would come out with something like 10 times the ad price. It would simply be put into escrow. There's a, uh, a hypothetical fact checker. Suppose that it's Snopes uh, or PolitiFact or Hoax Slayer or wonderfully even a random sample of Fox and CNN viewers. In this case, what you're trying to do is to eliminate bias. You just simply make it independent in here. A challenger could pay a simple challenge price more than the ad price to fact check the ad. The challenge should be more expensive than an ad because otherwise you should simply take out an ad if you simply disagree. Now, if the ad turned out to have been false, then the claim of the pledge goes to the challenger. If the ad is true, the, chain, the challenge goes back to the ad buyer. If there's no challenger, there's no harm, and the pledge simply goes back to the buyer, it's simply refunded. So what are the different properties of something like this? In this case, the ad buyer has an disincentive to lie. In this case, it's simply more expensive. You wouldn't guarantee an ad uh, that's gonna be, very, that's going to be uh, misinformation. A challenger has a disincentive to challenge if the only thing you're going to do is to prove an opponent right. If it's a true claim, then you're really not going to bother to do that. The platform, such as Zuckerberg's case or Twitter, uh, doesn't have the authority to decide the truth in this case. And the fact checker has no incentive to cheat because the challenge price is paid regardless. So 
unlike the uh, financial crisis in 2008, where the um, ratings agencies were paid by the banks doing the rating, in this case, there's no incentive to cheat. So th this is uh, unbiased and neutral. But notice in every single instance, the cost to guarantee truth is zero because it's simply refunded. In this case, again, the cost to guarantee the lie is expensive, but the cost to guarantee truth is zero either because it wasn't challenged, or because if it was challenged, it's then proved to be true and it's uh, refunded in the first place. The next element of this is in a technological sense or in a bottleneck sense, it easily scales. You only check the challenged ads and in that case, the costs are covered. It's all very straightforward. Most commonly, uh, one of the objections is, okay, well, what about half-truths in this case? Well, the beauty of this is we have a ready example immediately at hand. Many of you may have come across uh, the most recent case where a PAC for Trump bought an ad saying that Biden offered Ukraine a billion dollars to fire the prosecutor investigating Burisma over his son. What's interesting about that is that PolitiFact actually rated that as half-true. Yes, Biden's son did work for Burisma. Yes, a billion dollars was withheld. But no, it was not because they were preventing corruption. It was the opposite. It's because they were not investigating corruption. So for a half truth, you could simply get half the money back. What's fun about this is that gradations in this, of this estimation are not only possible, they're already happening. Uh, to give you some fun illustrations of this, and these are already available on there, um, Trump claims, for example, he won West Virginia by a margin of 42 points. 42 points. Well, ironically, actually, that one turns out to be true. Um, you know, or if you pick another example, uh, you know, there's a claim the Democratic-controlled House never asked John Bolton to testify. That turns out to have been false. Or the claim, you know, perhaps I was the person to save pre-existing conditions in your health care. Well, not only is that false, but the attempts to repeal uh, the prior legislation would have meant that the existing uh, protections on pre-testing conditions would have been overturned. So uh, PolitiFact rated that one pants on fire false. Here, it's simply an illustration that the gradations are possible, so it should actually, it should still possibly work. There's another element of this that actually has some interesting properties to it. So let's take a look at a couple of other interesting examples. So, how would you know how to set the pledge or the size of the lie price or the honest ads guarantee? What's interesting about this is it doesn't actually matter. It turns out that it's actually self-adjusting. Suppose that ExxonMobil keeps claiming that fossil fuels don't cause global warming or that Philip Morris claims that cigarettes don't cause cancer. There's something really interesting if this keeps happening. Because what that implies is the lie price is sufficiently low. In an economic sense, what's happening is that the private gain from lying is exceeding the social cost, and so they keep buying the ads. The implication is the externality is so high that you should increase the lie price. What this means is that we've now just found an economic mechanism, which is efficient search for the size of the negative externality that is in fact causing harm. So in the context of global warming or in the context of cigarettes or other things of that source, the honest ads guarantee actually serves as a mechanism to in some sense internalize the Kosian externality uh, exactly like um, a carbon tax on the global warming. Those kinds of things actually can be priced by a market mechanisms or a market for truth uh, in, this, um, in this particular con, uh, context. Another possible interesting thought on this is, well, what about poor political entrants, those that don't necessarily have the 10 times lie price in order to post the bond? Well, this one actually turns out to be quite easily. You simply pre-check the message. In that case, the bonds markets can easily ensure quantifiable risks. Again, the whole idea is to create a marketplace for truth. These kinds of things easily exist, and it would be very straightforward to try to ensure claims of that sort. Now, legal scholars among you might object one step further. Um, one of these is, what about First Amendment scrutiny? It's difficult to require a pledge to speak because uh, you can't require um, funding in that. That would be considered a friction or a limitation on speech. 
The beauty of this is that in political context, voluntary compliance is a signal. This is the source of the Nobel Prize in 2001 for information economics, uh, won by um, Akerlof, Spence, and Stieglitz. The idea is that credible signals are those which are expensive uh, in this it can actually signal a, uh, an important action. To give you another obvious illustration of this, do you trust a product that is sold as is? In this particular context, the reluctance of a super PAC to promise that it's not lying suggests that they probably are lying, especially when um, in this particular context, lying, not lying is actually free because it's actually uh, refunded uh, in this case, but you're putting something at risk, which makes it a credible signal. Uh, that, and you're going to be more likely to put out truthful messages in that context. For what it's worth, um, this is a whole, this is just number two in a whole collection of possible uh, market style interventions in a market for truth uh, to see how this works. Uh, but um, Jonathan asked us to keep this to about 10 minutes. So those of you that are interested, uh, we're actually working on a collection of these and would actually then you know, love to engage in discussion other ways to see if we could actually operationalize this. So uh, by all means, jump in, push uh, back and uh, let me know what you think. Marshall, thank you so much. Uh, the classic contestable proposition as a way of getting people thinking about things. Uh, and in fact, before we uh, turn to our third presentation and Joan Donovan, I just want to, if it's permissible, cold call uh, none other than uh, Dean Martha Minow, uh, who uh, couldn't help but feel was almost invoked by the mention of Newt Minow uh, in uh, Jill Lepore's presentation. But also here, I'm so curious, Martha, this seems to be like exactly in your wheelhouse to uh, ask an incisive question about. <laughs> and, uh, it's a very large wheelhouse, but this is like dead center. So I'm so curious uh, if there's a question on your mind that you'd want to ask uh, Marshall right now before we move on. Uh, it's an ingenious idea and it makes the idea of marketplace of ideas something real rather than uh, a distraction. So I'm intrigued by it. I, I'm interested in your last comment though about the bond market. I mean, it, I'm trying to think about the uh, auxiliary actors here who that might be the bond market. It might be the intermediaries that uh, do the pre-checking. Uh, none of that is free. So how do you think about those costs? So um, actually what I'd like to do, again, this is part of a much longer discussion, is to design a governance model to make, uh, to have other parties participate in, number, in numerous different ways. So the governance model, I would think, would split the same way that we use current governance between kind of executive, legislative, and judicial branches. Um, I would split the definition of fake news from the adjudication of fake news and then the execution of the rules applied to fake news. So you could, for example, get Fox and CNN to agree on the definitions of fake news, then organizations such as Snopes and PolitiFact and others um, could be the adjudicators of fake news. And then the platforms such, the social media platforms could be then the executors of the decisions regarding that fake news. But this, but you're correct, you then invite a whole host of other uh, parties because they're financial transactions to take an interest in the risk bearing. And it's entirely possible that the markets for risk bearing, the hedging, the insurance, uh, would be entirely happy to underwrite di different candidates um, in, different, in different ways. Uh, and again, given that there would be mechanisms to pre-check these things, you can then assign different risk levels to different categories of statement that are being made. And this could apply even to the risk levels that ExxonMobil might claim relative to the risk levels that Donald Trump might claim. So you could assign risk levels and different prices to exactly those kinds of things. And again, a marketplace here uh, ought to be able to price these things fairly efficiently. Jonathan, can I ask a question? Sure. Yes. Go ahead, uh, Jill Lepore. Um, yeah, I just think this is a fascinating presentation. I'm just wondering, though, Given that, I mean, I see this as largely a problem of civic education and uh, a better informed citizenry to outsource this to the market at a time of rising populist sentiment seems to me um, profoundly disempowering to ordinary citizens in a democracy. 
So I'm, I'm, I'm being your provocation with the provocation, um, but wonder how you'd respond to that. So, you know, my favorite article uh, on that kind of issue is a really wonderful one done uh, by Dana Boyd. Um, she has a fantastic article, which is, you think you want media literacy, do you? Uh, and it, it's a really wonderful send up of different ideas on that. She makes a couple of different points. Um, one of them is that the attempts to educate the population have a number of different effects. One of them is to get the exact same kinds of pushback that you get in other contexts, which who's presuming to do the education in this case. So lots of folks on the conservative side might say that liberals are trying to educate them and wouldn't have the right to do that. Uh, so another, the question that they necessarily pose is, what gives you the right to educate me in this, in this context? Uh, another point that she makes, which I think is also quite profound, is that the tendency to provide media literacy has empirical evidence to suggest that rather than being discriminating with between true and false information, the tendency is to reject almost all different media rather than to differentially dif um, uh, reject them. So that it is in some ways counterproductive and it has the tendency to make people more cynical. So um, in this case, the hope is to help clean up the media stream uh, and get people to make more truthful claims in addition to these other mechanisms. Now again, I, I think the market for truth has some potential to balance a lot of these different interests. My hope is that we can create a number of different knobs that you can tune. I'll give you a really simple example. In this case, a society that values greater freedom of expression could set the lie price very low. At the moment, the current lie price is zero. Um, you might anticipate a, an Asian society, which uh, doesn't value expression perhaps as much, but values the integrity of messaging higher. It might set the lie price higher, but even there, the beauty would be that in a different context, by tuning a different knob, dissidents could even get their message out rather than simply having a, a government say that, okay, you can't even discuss Tiananmen Square or other things at that point. I think one of the nice elements of this is you have knobs that you can tune with different societies able to tune them to different levels.